We'll give our biggest takeaways from Hornets exit day. What was the main storyline? We'll get into it today, Locked On Hornets. This is Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your pods, and that includes YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side, and I am a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play. There's Doug Branson. You can find his work on his Substack, everyhornetsboxscore.com. We appreciate him holding it down yesterday solo. And now, not only am I so high maintenance that I don't do it with just one, co-host now i need two david walker joins us and we welcome him back (laughs) to the fold to give his thoughts on the season and also exit day yesterday at the spectrum center you can find him on twitter by the way at david b walker well there's a lot to get to so no funny business at the beginning of the show let's just get right to it serious all all very serious and david we'll start with you biggest takeaway comment from coach clifford from one of the players what's the storyline you think was among the most important Oh boy, what a season, guys! First of all, it's great to be here again. I feel like I've missed a few weeks, and I've uh, I've missed this this banter back and forth. But I mean, I was thinking about this yesterday. Uh, the I mean, the the best storyline of the season for me was obviously Brandon Miller, his play, and what he was able to do on the court, surprising a lot of people. Uh, uh, you know, not us, uh, not 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 this podcast though. I think we were all over that from day one, as far as Brandon Miller being the. Uh, <laughs> The new yeah. brand or number two pick in this draft class, uh, yeah. but but I think as we pull back, obviously it's just the transition uh, that this team is currently in and will be going through for, for you know who knows how long. Um, on court, they finally made moves that they had to avoid making in terms of shedding uh, older players, larger contracts to move on and to start looking ahead. Um, and now you see Steve Clifford taking. Uh, a, a role in the front office as opposed to on the sideline. You see the new owners coming in. You see the changes happening around the arena. So, like, it's odd that right now we probably won't even see the effects of this season for another, you know, season, season and a half maybe, uh, depending on what happens in this offseason. So just a wild ride for this season to be uh, statistically, numbers-wise, wins-wise, like one of the worst ever. <laughs> and it felt as such along the way. I mean, shout out to Doug, who was doing the box score every night. My Lord, man, you you really did yeoman's work this year doing that. And kudos to you. Uh, but, you know, th- that's what I'll think about with this season. It was just a slog. You know, Brandon Miller was so fun. It was disappointing not to have LaMelo out there and Mark Williams he made it watchable and kudos to him. Uh, and then some of the young guys, you know, some of the changes they made, some of the additions to the roster, uh, getting Miles back, Grant Williams, but just a just a wild season that was ultimately a, a big time dud, except for, for <laughs> except for Brandon Miller. What do you think, Doug? Well, I think from the the exit interviews, the the big storyline was the injuries. Uh, well, injuries, but more specifically. Mm-hmm. The we got a little bit of a peek behind the curtain, uh, particularly of Mark Williams and his rehab process. Uh, but we also <laughs> we didn't get many words from Lamelo Ball, but we did get a few words on you know what classic. Yeah, it was it was. Uh, I'd love to discuss that <laughs> in some detail uh, because he won't discuss anything in detail. But um, but that was the focus, you know, of of I think the interviews and and you know, in terms of Mark Williams just getting some idea that. It, it appears like there's not going to be a surgery. It appears like he's going to be okay. Um, but but it also seems like there is concern from both of these players, LaMelo and Mark, of being sort of labeled uh, the, the injury guy. And so I think a lot of what we saw or what we mm-hmm. didn't see from them this season can be traced back to this fear that I think both of these players have of – of seriously critically hurting their entire career by playing through injuries. And, and and I think it's a big part of why we didn't see both of these players. Mark Williams was my biggest takeaway. The injuries were a big takeaway. You're right, Doug. I think if you just want to include LaMelo here, but Steve Clifford is always going to give you the most if he is going to be a part of a group talking all at once. He's going to be the one that is the most honest. He's going to be the most revealing in his comments and truly what he thinks. He's not going to mince words, right? 
I think Steve Clifford continuing in the step down press conference and the exit day interview yesterday, he continues to go back to a few of the games earlier in the season when they were healthy and they performed really well, like the Boston game. And I get it. I love the Boston game, too. What a fun win that was. Mark Williams was an animal out there. LaMelo was incredible in that game. And that's what Steve Clifford is holding on to. And I think as an extension, I think the organization is holding on to that as well. So if they're healthy, then you feel great about the foundation of this team. And I think Steve Clifford truly believes that. I think the organization truly believes that as well. Now, what they don't know is just how healthy these guys are going to be. Like, hopefully they can have Mark Williams play the entire year. Like Mark told you very confidently that he was going to play a lot of games next season. We don't know that as much from LaMelo, but... Clifford, I think he likes that foundation. We know about Miles Bridges. We've talked about that a lot. I mean, he's had, you know, so many nice things to say about Miles on the court this year. But they like the core if they can keep it together. Doug, what do you think? Well, but but Clifford also said that they never had an opportunity because of health yeah. to find a way to play. And meaning a way to play such that you could actually get to the playoffs and be competitive there. So while you can look at the Boston game and, and think about what if and dream a little bit, it needs to remain a dream because it's not reality. Because the reality is these guys haven't been healthy enough to be exposed to the fires, the trials, the tribulations that are required of a team to be a playoff team. They haven't been really over the past couple of seasons. And so it would be a mistake in my opinion, for the organization to look at that Boston game or anything that happened in the like 14 minutes that everyone was healthy and think to themselves what the, this organization has thought to themselves for the past couple of seasons, which is we have the talent, we're good, we're okay. If we just stay yeah. healthy, no, you can't think like that. It's got to be constant reloading. And I'll go back to Clifford one more time. He said in today's NBA, and I agree with this, he said in today's NBA, it's not about having eight or nine good players. Yeah. It's about having 11 or 12 mm-hmm. good players. Good teams constantly reload, find talent within their uh, system, but also go outwards and, 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 get, and they, they need to get bigger. They need to get more physical. There are problems with this team. It, it's not just about injuries. I'm going to keep screaming this until this organization listens. Well, they're, yeah, they're, I think with the core, they feel good about it. But you're right. I don't, I don't think Steve Clifford said anything to the tune of, hey, we're good. Did you, did you guys see Boston? We don't have to do anything. In fact, he said the right. opposite to what you're saying. I'm, right. I'm telling you they feel good about those guys and that the injuries really hurt them. Yeah. And what else seemed when, when you're discussing how to use Mark Williams, like it seemed Clifford was real self-reflective on his own coaching as it pertains to the center position. And he was yeah, asked, yeah. asked about regrets and then he thought about it and he keeps going back to Mark specifically, but also the center position because then he's saying whoever is the next head coach, he can't tell you that he likes being aggressive, blitz heavy on pick and roll, just because even if it works, and he was quick to say that, he was, well, it worked a lot, but he but he does seem to be pretty self-reflective and self-aware, saying we didn't play as many minutes to know for sure that that is going to be a season-long thing. So whatever coach comes in, they're going to have to do it their own way, and he preaches that constantly. So I think there's a lot of self-awareness. I think that it's okay to feel good about a healthy trio with Mark Williams, Brandon Miller, LaMelo Ball, and they probably feel good about a healthy four-player foundation with Miles Bridges in the fold. But I do think that there's some self-reflection. I do think they feel good about it. And also, it's not going to stop them from doing everything they can to try to improve the roster because any... They're, they don't look at this roster and think, hey, man, Boston, we're good. Let's chill a little I bit. Hope not. Go to the draft. I hope they don't not. Have- I mean, that's that's my question, though. They've been kind of doing this for the last three, four years, saying, well, when we're healthy. I mean, that was Mitch's go-to, really, right? It was like, like hey, we feel like we're a six-seed team when everyone's healthy and we're going to get everyone back. And he may be right, but, like, look, you can't – I mean, the biggest problem for them is their main guy, LaMelo Ball, is one of those guys that just has not played a lot. I mean, look, the Knicks dealt with a lot of injuries this year, too. They're the two-seed because they have a superstar stud in Jalen Brunson who was able to carry – a lot of that load for them. And like, is this team going to bank on the, th- those guys being healthy? Are they going to do, like Doug said, reload behind these guys regardless, or maybe find some guys that can even challenge, you know, some of these guys that aren't able to keep themselves on the floor. So, I mean, that's the biggest question to me 
for the organization as a whole? Are they going to look at these guys? I mean, they're kind of ham, they're kind of trapped with Lamelo, right? There's not a ton they can do there. They kind of do have to cross their fingers uh, from 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 that standpoint. But uh, they've got to get bigger, as Doug said. You know, I, when we talk more about the draft, that may be something to bring into consideration. But yeah, are are they going to lean back on that and say, "Hey, we were healthy for that one game. It was awesome." It doesn't sound like it, but I mean, man. That's going to be a shift in how they've built and how they've done things. Uh, I, I don't want to. I don't want to let what you said go there about the Steve Clifford uh, regrets that he has about the center position. So I want to. I want to comment on that. But we also have to. We have to talk about Lamelo Ball. We have to talk about. Um, I, I don't know whether he talked about ankle braces or not. It was sort of. It was sort of vague. But we should talk about his continued discussion on his injury as well in the next segment. Okay. All right. That's what we'll do. Thank you for bringing up ankle braces again. <laughs> Coming up next on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets. I'm going to keep bringing them up until someone wears them. I, maybe me. I'm, I might just start wearing them. Oh, I'll do it. Just... I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. I, I got them. I got them somewhere deep in the closet when I used to play basketball, but I will bring them out if it means we don't have to talk about them anymore. We'll talk more about the main takeaway from Exit Day. <laughs> Coming up next, Locked On Hornets. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off of our chest. Big or small, certain things can really start to get to you. It's important to let that out, especially to someone who is unbiased on your life. So today, you might want to say how you really feel about something. You might even be thinking about it constantly, the same thing every single week. Therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports team or exit day interviews, whatever. It's important to get those things off of your chest every once in a while. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA. More Locked On Hornets ahead. All right, Doug, let's get to your LaMelo takes from, I'm guessing, you, did you want to discuss the substance, maybe a little bit, the style in which he presents it with not a whole lot of, I don't know, information on it, with not a whole lot of talking back <laughs> to the people? How do you want to talk about LaMelo's appearance at the podium? I mean, it is really interesting, right, to have your about-to-be highest-paid player, max-level player, and I think arguably the best player on the team, uh, not play a majority of the season, uh, not play a majority of the past couple of seasons, and then come to the podium and, and on an exit interview and really not say anything, have one of the shortest interviews, but also one that is the, the least substance filled of, of, the, of the interviews. I mean, you had uh, Brandon Miller, Grant Williams, all of these players come out and, and I think adequately answer some questions. And for Mark Williams, he was answering some tough questions about his injury and about him not playing it. He was vulnerable and opening up about the process. And LaMelo just seems to be unwilling to do so. And I don't know if that's rooted in just uh, maybe a distaste for the media or that he feels like he doesn't have to, or that he maybe is just in a frustrated space about like, why am I talking about a season in which I didn't get to play? Maybe he's just super mm -hmm. frustrated by that idea. I don't, I don't know what it is. And, and listen, whatever you think about the media, if you hate the media, if you love the media, whatever you think about it, it is part of the process. And the, the one of the ways that players and teams communicate with fans and, and to not use that uh, seems to be not just a disservice to fans, but also a disservice to LaMelo, who, look, e even if everything is rosy from here on out, guys, if he completely recovers from this injury and goes on to have an all-NBA Hall of Fame career, it's going to be over in a relatively short amount of time relative to the rest of his life. But but if, it, if these injuries keep up, it might be even shorter than that. And so it just it's sad for me to see someone not seem to enjoy some part of the whole experience. What do you think? I mean, it's a, yeah, it's the, the amount of frustration has got to be huge uh, for LaMelo. Like, uh, you know, he didn't comment, you know, specifically, I don't think like on how many games he wanted to play, but other people did. I mean, there were other guys that said, Hey, I've talked to LaMelo. He wants to play what? I don't know. 75. 75 I think that 75 was the target. According to miles bridge. That's, that's a good number. Yeah. Miles. Yeah. That. That's a good number. So like, and LaMelo's 
never been the guy, right? Except for if you catch him coming off the court and he gives you a funny quote, but he's never given us a lot of substance. But I'm, you know, I'm kind of with you, Doug. It's it's frustrating for the fans because now you are starting to see uh, the injury. You know, the, the 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 his his lack of ability to stay on the court is frustrating for him, obviously, but also for the fans because it's like we're we're counting on this guy, we're waiting on this guy. The ankle braces thing. I'm with you, Walker. Like I'm sick of hearing of it. God knows LaMelo gets asked about it. I know he doesn't – we know he doesn't want to wear them. I I don't necessarily think because they work for Steph Curry, they're going to work for LaMelo Ball or they work for this person, so it's going to work for the next person. I don't know. But 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 we don't, we have no idea because we just don't see a whole lot of, of, of light shined on that fact. He's worn them a little bit in practice. He's never worn them in games. You know, some of the injuries – keep happening so it, it, people are frustrated I, I you know i get it i'm not saying he necessarily i need for him to wear them I, we just need for him to be to be out there and 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 lamello's approach to this i know doug i know just hold on one second his approach to this is very much <laughs> is very much in the in the style in the old style of hornets communications which was basically nothing right we never knew what was going on we never had a whole lot of insight in and it's some of the thinkings, whether it's the front office, the the uh, the encore decisions, or, or stuff like that. And Lamelo stays very surface level, and there's just a, not a lot of stuff. Even if the answers to the ankle brace stuff is like, yeah, we'll see. His approach is we'll see, which I love sometimes. But like we are craving to see this guy on the floor and just move on. And I I, I don't know when it's going to happen. I have no idea. We'll it see is does. great. We'll see is great if you're not about to be paid like a hundred, you know, two hundred plus, mm. two hundred fifty million dollars. Well, and that's gonna, go and that's when it's gonna get bad. I mean, think about the think about the Gordon Hayward. Think about the Nick Batum. Like it doesn't go well when you see that number and you don't see the minutes reflecting it on the court. And, and we're we're staring down the barrel of that right now. All right, last thing on the media piece. To to be one of the greatest players in your sport you have to be the face of your franchise. This is a little logic puzzle for mm. you guys. Would you agree with that? If you're going to be the face of the NBA, you first have to be the face of your franchise, right? To be the face of a franchise, you've, you've got to go out there and speak to the media. You've got to be the face of the franchise, okay? So I'll just put that out there. If, he's, if, if that is a goal for him, if a goal for him is to be one of the best players in the NBA, you don't have to like the media. There are a lot of faces of the NBA right now, Kevin Durant, Jimmy Butler, who are antagonistic with the media. New media. Okay? Yeah, like, they like new media. Well, that's fine. But you have to interact with them. <laughs> what, we're not, what we're getting yeah. right now is not antagonism. What we're getting right now is indifference. And that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work for fans, and it's not going to work for LaMelo. Okay, so that's, that's the final piece on that. Here's something interesting, and I actually go to another sport here, MLB. There's a lot of talk in baseball right now about pitchers throwing hard and, pitcher cl and the pitching clock, and is it blowing up arms? And I, I, I might get this guy's last name wrong, but Tyler Glass now, a, a, a big starting pitcher in the, ML, in the MLB right now, said that, look, given the choice between throwing as hard as I can and staying completely healthy, I'm going to choose throwing hard every single time. And the reason Old school, baby. Well, it's old school, but it is if you like – if you break that down to its fundamental, what Tyler is saying is if I don't throw hard, I won't be in mm -hmm. the league anyway. If I'm not the, the maximum player I can be, I'm not going to be in the league anyway, even if I'm healthy. I'll be the healthiest guy in AAA. I'd rather be to, to, to roll the dice and be the player I am. Mm -hmm. I really feel like that's how LaMelo is viewing this situation. He has been an instinctual player his entire life. It's, all, it's been about feel. It's been about just that something that you can't really tangibly touch, right? So for that player, I think comfort is going to be the maximum consideration. And I think for LaMelo, he's like, look, if I wear ankle braces and I, and my ankle remains healthy, but I stink because I'm uncomfortable, I'm going to be out of the league anyway. Or I'm, I mean, I might be getting paid, but I'm okay. not going to, I'm not going to be good. So, okay. so I think that's, that's a big part of this. I see you. I see you landed the plan on that. I didn't Thank know you. quite where we were Thank going. You. I didn't know I where didn't that was going it. either. But and then I, once you did the comfort <laughs> thing, I was I was able to get yeah. there. Connecting the, the dots, the, folks. That's why they pay me the big bucks. The the, the difference yeah. is, I guess, you know, the the whole trying to prevent the injury thing with Lamelo. Like you might just not be able to go out there at all, and it's not like that 
restricts you from doing anything. It doesn't seem like. Does he slower with the ankle braces? I, I know it's a comfort thing. You are restricting a skill with Tyler Glass now. I don't know if you're restricting a skill with Lamelo. It's all about comfort. And can you get through that mental hurt? Or Doug, you got something else? Uh, sorry, I know I've had the face the entire episode, but I, <laughs> I'm just bursting I, because these exit interviews, they, they're so it's so much information in your face all at once, and I'm trying to process it all. But to your point, Walker, I'm going to agree with you. Like. There was one interesting thing that LaMelo did say, and you had to dig and you kind of, you may have to fill in a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's like one of those puzzles where your brain fills in the gaps where the lines are, they look wavy, but uh, they're actually straight because your brain is filling in gaps. You have to do that with LaMelo's quotes sometimes. But he did mention something when talking about his rehab process where he's trying to rehab the ankle while maintaining his shot. And there was a lot that was made mm. of LaMelo and how he landed on shots and he was landing on one foot and mm. there's stuff in his ankle. And so I think that's a big concern for LaMelo is like, okay, look, we can rehab this ankle. We can make me stronger. We can do such and such, try these braces, whatever. If I don't feel comfortable shooting from deep, then all of this is stupid. There's no reason to do this if I can't keep my shot the way my shot is. All right, a couple right. of mellow things. If we do the braces talk thing, one my, my take on the braces thing would be, and look, I'm with you, David. Like I've I've jo joked about that, not wanting to talk about it a million times. But yeah, I'm the one that let the kid out of the bag when I asked him about it, just because we didn't know if he was wearing it. Like we didn't know, and then once he said, right. "No, I'm not," and he got real quiet. He's like, "Nah." <laughs> that was his well, answer. He knows. I yeah. Mean, I, yeah. You know. He does. And so and, and we, we understand that he's not wearing them because because they're not comfortable. My biggest question has always been, are the trainers, are doctors telling you to wear? Yeah, 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 yeah. And if they are and you're still not doing it, that's when it's a huge problem. But if they're not and they're saying there's another way to get through this, right. then OK. Who am I yep. to disagree with whatever that trainer or doctor is telling you? What I think we can do is I think we can infer that they probably are telling him to wear them if he is still trying to tell you at the podium, we're going to try to figure out some custom-made ankle braces and see if we can make it work. Why try to make it work if the trainers or doctors aren't telling you to wear them? So I think just based off of inference, I think we can say, yep, they're, they want you to wear the braces, and so that's my take on the braces. With the relationship with the fans, I think that's exactly what fans want from your star player is a relationship with your star player, and we're not getting that, and I think you're right about that, Doug. It doesn't mean that LaMelo – I mean, he, this is how he's been his entire NBA career. Mm -hmm. Remember, we got the rumors in the interview process that he didn't play out well, that teams maybe – I don't know if they mm -hmm. dropped him, but there was that report during the entire pre-draft process – that he wasn't doing well in interviews. I don't know how true that was, but that was the rumor, and it was, seemed to be pretty understood. It feels, it feels so, true now. Yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, what, what has he done? What? Yeah, and it's, it's not like he was saying anything wrong. He wasn't saying anything at all. And so if you're prying yeah. for information constantly, I could see how the enigma that is LaMelo and what he's thinking would turn you off to drafting him, but – the Hornets decided to do it, and it was absolutely the correct pick. But fans do want that relationship with their star player because now you get to hear him at the microphone constantly, and you get to see him on the court, and both of those things are ways that you can build a relationship. But if he's not on the court and he's not on the mic, now you're doing the whole out of sight, out of mind thing. And even when he is at the podium, you ask, hey, what did LaMelo say at exit day? I, he didn't say a lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, there's just nothing to grasp onto. There's nothing. And so I think that is the issue. He might not care. I'm not even telling you that it matters a ton. But what I am telling you is right. if you care about what the fans think, that's what the fans want. And you don't have to give them what they want. You don't have to whatsoever. But that's what they want, and they're being denied that. Well, and what it, what it also does is it doesn't give him the benefit of the doubt. Like, fans are not going to give him the benefit of the doubt anymore. You know what I'm saying? When you don't establish that relationship. Well, that's what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, then, then there's no – you know, then, then, then fans, and I'm not just talking about Hornets fans. I'm talking about NBA fans because you know Lamelo might have another team at some point in his in his career, and so NBA fans might just say, "Well, you know, this guy's this guy's hurt all the time. He stinks." And there because there well, there isn't that relationship established. Yeah. The other thing too is there's a player on this team right now, a young player, a rookie, 
who is establishing relationships, who's who even it has yeah, like is. a weird catchphrase, which is a long drawn out thank you. Like he is, he seems fine, and he's <laughs> talking about I want to be a vocal leader, and that's Brandon Miller. Brandon Miller is coming in, and there's a vacuum on this vacuum of leadership, vacuum of personality on this team. There has been for a long time. Brandon Miller saw that vacuum, and he is he is filling it up, folks. Yeah, and I think it's – it's I don't want to say it's an easy fix for Lamella, but a lot of this can go away by getting on the court and being the player that he was. You know what I mean? So, like, a lot of the stuff, talk about media and fan relations and blah, 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 no one cares when he was doing that stretch uh, in November, December, you know, putting up 29 points a game. No one really cared about that. They cared about it when they didn't see him play. And, like, I was on board with him – with them shutting him down. Now, whether they should have announced that – prior or earlier like that was fine they did the right thing that's what that's what tanking teams do when they're doing it the right way <laughs> they don't play their good players okay Kate Cunningham I don't, I don't think he's down. played the end of the last three seasons so like I was fine for that there was no reason for him to play I, I think we do have to give him this offseason this new regime I, I do feel like there needs to be some sort of, of of table setting or getting on the same page in the building like overall but especially when you're talking about your franchise player, your star player, what is the United front that we are putting forth to kind of build this wave of optimism going into the new, to the new season? Like how does he receive the new coach? How does he do all this stuff? So like, it's not, this is not uh, over. The story is not being, being, the story is still being written. It's just, we need to see some, the more, uh, some more upswing from LaMelo, get back to what he was doing the best. And I think that would make him happier, right? Like if he's playing, that's when he's his happiest. That's when you are going to get these, a few little nuggets here and there. But this is just a frustrating time, and it feels like it's been going on forever for him. All right, there is a bright spot from one star player to another. Coming up next on the Locked on Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. We'll get to that bright spot now. Brandon Miller, he spoke to media yesterday. We'll go through his comments and discuss the bright spot that is uh, the rookie from this past season. Coming up next on Locked on Hornets. This episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. We've all been there, either as a player or as a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard, not looking too good. You're feeling low. Not sure you or the team can pull out a win, but that's when you dig deep, lift your head up, and say to yourself, time to get back in the game. Pull off some bank heists and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's exactly what you should be saying. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards, make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball, aggressive Monopoly, mm. charge the other players rent for your iconic properties, realistic Monopoly. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there. Put on your game face and download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. More Locked On Hornets ahead. Doug, one thing I'll say before we move on to some of the funny moments like, as it pertains to Brandon and building relationships, you're absolutely right with what Brandon is doing with the team. I, I think Brandon's personality is it, it hits on so many different things you want from your star player. He is as competitive as you can possibly be. Maybe he should download Monopoly Go. He's as competitive <laughs> as you can possibly be out there on the court. He's yelling at the veterans, but in a way, and I ask him about when you yell at the veterans, when that clip on social media goes viral and everybody loves you yelling at the teammates to get back and transition defense, and you've done that multiple times. Like There was a yeah. few of those clips. One went more viral than the other. I asked him about what the conversation is like after you call them out and everybody gets to see you do that and he said mm -hmm. look it's been all respect i think everybody understood it if i'm not holding the players accountable then i'm not doing my job and i would absolutely expect them to do that to me it's all love either way and that's the way that i approach it i want to be a vocal leader i want to galvanize the troops in order to get a victory but also brandon is such a class clown like he's so funny yeah. in the locker room like he's constantly engaging with with his teammates and I think media I think sometimes he'll be a little turned off to media which every athlete is right like we can be annoying 100 percent 
But I think when he's in a good mood or when things are going well enough, yeah, yes, even you, Doug, I'm surprised. Even, yeah, it, even me, it happens. But Brandon Miller, it, it feels like he presses the right buttons with his personality at all times. And I think that's what fans gravitate towards. But also, it helps that you have a 6'9", versatile wing mm -hmm. who looks like the potential is all NBA. So that's always going to help the fan base. But the personality... It's there, too, and that, that's why I think fans are excited about him. What also helps is that he's a member of the Charlotte Hornets because if he had brought some of that bravado to the Miami Heat, to the L.A. Clippers, to the Boston Celtics, you, you know, with actual players that have, you know, gone to conference finals and finals and won championships – I don't think that that same kind of attitude would have been as well received. This is the perfect or shown, or you probably that's the thing you don't you don't show it right. right. Like that's the reason you right. probably don't yell at freaking Jimmy Butler <laughs> to get back on transition defense. But guess what? We don't have Jimmy Butler, so that's it's right. okay, and that's why people. I'm reminded of that every well, day. We do not have Jimmy Butler. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like the time the Lakers were going crazy and. Kobe was out and they had like eight wins or something. And he was just could not have been more disgusted that they were having fun, <laughs> you know, on camera. Yeah. That's, uh, right. that, that, that's, that's what, that's what, that's what you can't do other places to your point, Doug. Like we get a, they get a few wins here and you see him like, you know, joking in the background of, a, of another player's on court interview or something like that, or his little, like, yeah, his little like bye or thank you exit thing. So it's been fun to see him. It, it shows he's still a, a young guy, right? I mean, he's still got that playful energy, but he's almost being thrust into this leadership position on this team. It'll be really interesting to see if they try and bring in a few more veteran guys that can still contribute, that can kind of of show him the ropes you know of the league of of, of how to operate uh moving forward with this team but clearly dude i mean we were all off a little bit on on draft night because he's been an absolute revelation he's been awesome he should be number two uh amongst rookies but walker as, as you have pointed out definitely the second best player in that draft and and in that draft class so just been just been great i just i i hope it doesn't go into the weird zone that Dwight Howard went into because I think he started off in the same kind of silly mode. Right. And everyone it, loved it. Everyone, yeah, everyone loved, loved it. it at first. And then it sort of went into this weird zone, which was like, what is Dwight? What's he trying to do here? I don't, I don't understand what his, what's going on. Just, just go and win back. At some point you've got to shed that and then get serious and win basketball games. So, you know, I, I just hope it doesn't dip into that weird territory. I don't think it's in your face as much because Dwight was like that yeah. in the interviews as much. I think Brandon is, it's a little bit more for his teammates more than it is for everybody just, else. Yeah. So I mean, I'm you just got to win. You got to keep winning yeah. big games. I mean, that's, sure. a, you know, then you can be, but yeah, I yeah. think, you know, it's, it's, it is that there is a yeah. fine line between Dwight Howard. It's funny. And, and Shaq's funny, you know, one's endearing and the other is weird and annoying. Um, funny. Speaking of funny moments, funny moments from media day, Doug, you want to lead us off here with what you have? Oh yeah. Just, uh, the, my favorite moment was we haven't talked a lot about Steve Clifford because we've been talking about that guy for, for a while now because he stepped down early, but during his interview, someone, I know, I know it wasn't you. Cause I know that voice when I know those deep baritones, when I hear them come, <laughs> you're like one of the few people, they have to turn up the volume on a lot of folks for you to even recognize who they are, Booney and a couple of other uh, folks. Yeah. But when you talk, they don't have to turn to the volume or anything. I'm like, yep. And maybe that's just me having been around you for a long time. But I'm I recognize, guess that helps. Yeah, yeah, probably. But I recognize your voice. This wasn't you, but someone asked Clifford what his high point was in his yeah. time in his second time here, and his mm -hmm. answer was, eh. <laughs> I knew he was going to get killed for it. Poor Steve, because because there's like it's okay to think about it, but if you spend any yeah. time about it people are going to destroy you i thought about that as it was happening and he's going ah oh, man let's see i was like you waited no, no, three no, no, seconds no 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 no, 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 no 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 why it's funny is is because he didn't say it like that if he had said it like you just said it uh eh, um if he had done that it would have it wouldn't have been funny what was funny is that it went into this larry david curb your enthusiasm territory yeah. where he goes <laughs> eh, like it would just, he held it on. There was a, I don't, it's, it's like milliseconds or seconds between, again, talking about thin lines. Yeah. There's a thin line between yeah, I'm is. thinking about something and then, oh my God, I don't really even know yeah. what to say because there was no high point because I bought a haunted house.
what what's great about that and what's so comedic about it is Steve knows that line too, and so he's frantically <laughs> looking for it. We all understand. Mm-hmm. We we all are in that situation. If you ask me, it's like your wife or your significant other asking you, you know, what was your favorite thing that we've done this past year? And you're uh like and then uh, you know you have a you ha- you need to get that. You gotta answer have that out. in your back pocket. You, woo, you gotta have it. And then if you don't, then yeah, you're probably going to get into uh, a little bit of a moody afternoon because of, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so like that, that's what happened with Steve. It's like, oh man, I didn't say anything right. Goodness gracious. So yeah, I think Steve knowing that you need to get that answer out real quickly. I think that's what, I think that's what made it so funny as well. Um, I have a few. Uh, so I will go with the interviews that we had one funny moment with Grant Williams on Weston Walker, which you can check out on WFNZ.com. With Grant Williams, I asked him about all the drama that he experienced with Dallas, and he gave this phenomenal answer, man, like real, you know, I'm going to take the high road here. That's what Grant Williams has been doing this entire time. Okay, so nothing was funny about the answer. 25 minutes later, after he gives that answer about dodging all of the drama and just letting everything come to the light, Bobby Portis throws that astray on the Shams podcast at Grant Williams. He has become... The butt of all it's of the bizarre. power forward what jokes. Is, what is going? There has to be something behind the scenes. Yeah. There's something we don't know. There is a puzzle piece that is missing because everything that I hear from Grant Williams, go listen to his. He sounds like a coach. Like he sounds like an executive. Like the the yeah, way does. like he is so good at communicating and getting me fired up to be a Charlotte Hornets fan. Like I love that. There there has to be something within the player to player relationship that is completely broken down with Grant Williams and the rest of the league because he is. Like people are just not afraid to take a shot at this guy. They're really not. Yeah, that's the that that's weird because it was a real thing, especially of course once he got once he got to Charlotte, like a big light was shine on shown on it. But I, I don't get it either. I was about to say, where is all this coming from? I guess he could be a, a, a pestiferous presence on the court, uh, but he's certainly not the first guy that's grab you know, my, be a grab, bit my dictionary, out there. grab my dictionary. Grab my dictionary on that one. Whew. Where's that a one? Little, the little, source little, boy. Yeah. A little, a little, a little, a little, for you on a Tuesday. so uh but you know what i think i don't think that's the worst thing for the hornets to have that presence uh at this point you know they need somebody who can mix it up a little bit and, and bring something that you know may may raise an eyebrow or two mm-hmm. i mean it's not the worst thing for them to get a little weird energy out there well and the other thing is even after the grant williams interview we had brandon miller on and Brandon, what was funny is we played a clip of Sam Farber calling Brandon's dunk against Atlanta, and he was loving it. Like he was, he was doing the reaction again. He was like, do it as he's putting the mic on and the headset on. He's doing the action that he did against Atlanta, so he's reliving it. We talk about that. He loves his dunk. Like I was like, how many? You've mm-hmm. watched that probably thirty times. He's like. Yeah, with the with the sound going on in the background, I've definitely watched it a few times with Eric Collins, Sam Farber. It brings it to a different level. But <laughs> then he he also talked more about the dunk on how Bruno Fernando, I think, was the the victim there, right? So I think if that's the case, whoever was the victim, they had dunked on Grant Williams and got him bad. So. Uh, so like grant williams catches two strays before i could even end the show after talking about grant and then they're talking about did you just get me because i dunked on grant it's just that was funny last thing for me i know i'm rambling but last thing for me is we you know how about the rap beef that's going on between k dot and everybody's throwing disses at each other rick of course of course yes yes yes. Uh, i'm sorry who is k dot yeah, that's right. So, um, <laughs> for the now, I Hornets, Hornets owner, we've got some Hornets ownership. Well, in yes, that, do we not? yes. So, so Jay Cole was in this, but then he retracted his diss, which uh-huh. I don't know if I've ever seen before. He apologizes for it, uh-huh. and then we oh, were talking about it as Trey Mann was walking in the room, and then we got. Tra- Trey's analysis on all of the beef and he's like yeah you know Rick Ross was was good and you know I thought Drake really did a great job I I wasn't even a big fan of Drake but my uncle was and so you know like he got me on Drake (laughs) yeah it's amazing right it's amazing but then the funny part was I was like well you know you don't have to answer this if you don't want to Trey but you know an owner within the organization also was involved in all of this what did you think about the apology? You don't have to answer. You don't if if you need to plead the fifth, no, that's uh, fine. Sure, no, answer the question. Well, he did, and Trey said, "Honestly, man, I didn't even listen to any of J. Cole stuff." Like, 
<laughs> or at least at Whoa. least with the dissing stuff. I don't know if, if that means right. the entire catalog, but he said, I didn't listen to it. I didn't listen to the diss. I didn't listen to any of it. So I thought that was funny because Trey was like, look, I know he's a part of the team. I, I ain't got nothing for you, Jay. Oh, I ain't got nothing for you. Now, I wonder how much owning the uh, owning a piece of the Charlotte Hornets played a factor in that retracting the disc. You know, it could have been a Republican bu- Republicans buy sneakers, too. You know, maybe all all rap fans can be <laughs> Hornets fans. So, you know, That's I got to. Right. I got to step back. I don't know. Uh, I have one more from LaMelo. Uh, this was his thoughts on the coaching hire. Quote, I think the whole organization as a whole is just moving in the right way. So I just feel like they are going to make the right move or whatever. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> or whatever. Classic LaMelo. You, listen, you, you will not – it's so funny to me, these questions of like, ooh, are they going to consult LaMelo on the coaching hire? Are they going to consult him on the draft? It's like – I don't think you could accuse this guy of being la GM because it just doesn't seem like he nah. cares. He seems like he's solely focused on getting these ankles figured out and good back out on the court, which and is good. what we want, which is what we want. Yeah. We want him out yeah. on the court. All right. Finishing thoughts, David. I, I don't know if you had any funny moments or if you wanted to talk about the season again, just any finishing thoughts you wanted to. I do about. not. I never <laughs> want to talk about the season yeah. ever again. Um, <laughs> I think we've I think we've we've, we've put it to bed. Okay. Well, you you Hopefully you we were you were more active in the community and watching more games at the time when the Bobcats were were really tanking those two oh, seasons 11 yes. 12 12 13. So I mean relative to those you know It doesn't seem like that. Like I thought about those it does not seem like that you know doldrums of the league but it is. I mean, what can I tell you why? Can, I think you're yes. right and can I tell you why? And it is, it's a simple answer. It's the simplest answer. It is injuries because those, if you look back at the 11, 12, uh, and the 12, 13 team, I'm sure they had their injuries, but you got 70 plus games from Kemba. And, and I mean, he was coming off the bench a little bit in his rookie season, but yeah. in the sophomore season when they were just as bad, you got plenty of games from Kemba. You got plenty of games from your better players. It was just that your best players were awful. Whereas with the Hornets, mm-hmm. you have that, yeah. Ex- yeah. you have that built in excuse. And you can say, you can look at the Boston game. There was no Boston game in those two seasons. And that's why it feels that way, even though the records are similar. That'll do it yeah, for Locked yeah. on Hornets. Go ahead and uh, subscribe. Hit the notification button on YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. We appreciate you making us your first listen. There's David Walker helping us out. Follow him on Twitter at David B. Walker. Doug Branson on his sub stack, everyhornetsboxcourt.com. Also on Twitter at Doug Branson, LOH. Listen to WFNZ, Wes and Walker, 12 to 3, every single weekday. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow for more Exit Day Recap.